for coming in to tonight's discussion. We're going to talk about musical instruments. Um, I'm going to talk about music classification systems, and then I'm going to pass the floor over to uh, Wang Mingjia, and he'll talk about the clarinet specifically. So uh, I hope you were here early enough to watch those two videos. First, the, the, the video uh, of Wang Mingjia on the, the uh, traditional or the period clarinet, and then the second video that was shown there of the theremin and the piano. And it wouldn't surprise me if many of you tuning into this, this video saw that, you know, that second, that music production of the theremin and were just completely surprised as to what that instrument is. That's a theremin. And so I, I wanted to show that video to get us into this discussion because what I think is important, if you're interested in music, if you're inter interested in learning instruments, if you're interested in composition, um, or you know, just anything that's music related, it's always important to understand the relationship of instruments. And so let me get my, before I get started here, let me get my PowerPoint up. And here we go. All right, so tonight I wanted to really delve into uh, the relationship of musical instruments and how we as scholars, myself and ethnomusicologists, you know, when we travel around the world and we see musical instruments for the first time, how do we relate those instruments that we that are new to us to instruments that are already known? Uh, and so I present you with a couple of ideas about instrument classification. And I want I wanted to teach you the stronger of the two tonight with the hopes that it will encourage you to study more about musical instruments, but it'll also, it'll help you as you learn musical instruments. The one thing you're gonna know after tonight, you may not know the name of the instrument. You may not know how the instrument is used within a given cultural system or musical tradition, but at least if you see an instrument for the first time, you understand how to classify that instrument in relationship to other instruments around it. So with that, let's get started. So we're talking tonight, I'm talking tonight, about the study of organology. Organology is the science to classifying musical instruments. And in the West, there are two primary systems for organological classifications. There is the Victor Mahayon system, which was somewhere around 1875, 1874 to be specific. And then there's the Kurt Sox and Eric von Hornbostel system, which is the more commonly used system and that's from about 50 years later, from about uh, 1915 or so. We'll start with the Mahillon system. Now, Victor Mahillon was from Brussels. He was a Belgian-born musician, uh, a, a writer, and a, and a builder of instruments. And he got his first major job working as the curator for the Instrument Museum at the Royal Conservatory in Brussels. Um, and he spent his career not only building instruments, but collecting instruments from around, uh, primarily around Europe. And, and in toll, he, he was able to establish a collection of about 1,500 instruments at the Royal Conservatory in Brussels. The primary challenge, though, for Victor Mahillon is that the majority of the instruments he collected were European. And out of the Mahillon system is where we find the foundation for what I consider the most commonly used instrument classification system in the public school system of the United States. So if you go to any elementary school or middle school and you walk into the band halls or the orchestra halls, they're going to have posters that look very similar to this. And, and they're going to teach us that, you know, the, the Western orchestra has four sections. It has a string section, a woodwind section, a brass section, and a percussion section. And maybe, maybe they might uh, also include what's considered a keyboard section. But more often than not, it's these four instrument categories, woodwinds, brass strings, and percussion. Now, for the layperson who, who's not really concerned about you know, the specifics of how we classify instruments. This system works. And so I really don't degrade this system when it comes to getting kids involved with music, because this is a very simple way for kids to approach music. It's very accessible, even though there's a major flaw in this system. 
and that is the piano. So if you open up a grand piano or if you open up an upright piano and you look at the way a piano works, you'll see that there's an entire row of strings that's, you know, obviously the larger strings play the lower notes and then they, they shrink in size to, as the, the range of pitch goes higher. But so you, you would think, well, there it's, it's theoretically a string instrument, but you realize that as you play the keys, it, it manipulates a system of hammers that then strike the, the strings. So anytime you take something, you take a, stri a stick or you take a hammer or a mallet and you strike another object, it becomes a percussive instrument. So there's the flaw. Is a piano a percussion instrument or is it a string instrument? Uh, and we can't have it both ways. I mean, I guess for elementary school kids, they don't, they're not really concerned about the flaw in the system. But for scholars, for somebody like myself, who's an ethnomusicologist, when I go around the world and I find new, new instruments for the first time, I need to have a crisp and clear criteria for which I classify musical instruments. I jokingly tell my students that, you know, if you find a new animal, you don't look at that animal and go, is it a reptile or is it a mammal? You know, is it a, is it a, a frog or is it a horse? Yet there are clear criteria within, within the biological and zoological systems that allow for any, that, that push away the ambiguity so that we know based on clear criteria what, how to classify a new object into the system. So with that in mind, most ethnomusicologists and I would say the large majority of musicologists now use what's referred to as the Sox and Hornbostel system or the Hornbostel and Sox system. Um, it was devised in the early part of the 20th century by the German musicologist Kurt Sox and the Austrian ethnomusicologist Eric von Hornbostel. And basically what they did is they took the Mahion system and they said, how do we solve the inherent flaws in the system? And so what they did is they created a system of four categories based upon the principle of pitch, sound and pitch. So what we're gonna look at tonight are the four categories, aerophones, chordophones, idiophones, and membranophones. Now, if you look at each of these categories, aerophone, chordophone, idiophone, and membranophone, they're all rooted in the word phone. Phone means sound. And in this case, we're referring to pitch. So if you study music, you'll study monophonic music, or you'll study polyphonic music, or you'll study homophonic or heterophonic music. All of these concepts in terms of the layers of sounds are rooted in the word phone. So phone means sound. It comes from the linguistic phony or phonic or phonetic. So what's the criteria then of the Sox and Hornbostel system? Well, it's two basic questions. The first question is, where does the sound occur? Where does the vibration? So if we, if we backtrack for a second and you understand the acoustics of sound, you understand that the, the pitch or the sound is nothing more than a vibration. So we wanna ask the basic question, which is where does that vibration occur? Does it occur on a string? Does it occur via air? Does it occur via a membrane or a skin? Or is it the entire body that vibrates to produce the sound? Now, once we answer that question, where does the sound, where is the sound trigger or where does the sound occur? We then ask a secondary question and that is, how is the sound triggered? Is it triggered by striking it, by plucking it, by bowing it, by shaking it? So, and that's where we get into the, 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 the separations of timbre. So I say, this might interest you if you're a, um, a composer or if you're interested in orchestration, you understand how you want to you want to delve into how instruments are separated by timbre. It's that second question in organology that answered that that gets you into that discussion. Now, when we talk about sound, we talk about pitch, and we have to understand that pitch can be defined two ways. It can be defined as definite. So you take a pitch pipe and you blow a note. You can take that same note and you can recreate it on another instrument. So that means that that is a definite pitch. Instruments that create definite pitch tend to be melodic instruments. Conversely, you take an instrument that still creates a sound, 
but you can't recreate this sound with another instrument. It's an indefinite pitch. So instruments that have an indefinite pitch are typically rhythmic instruments. All right, so we'll start with the aerophone. Aerophone means a column of air. So you take a tubing, you take a piece of tube, and you blow air through the tube. Now, that is theoretically an aerophone. The problem is, is how do you get the air to vibrate, to vibrate, to whistle, to produce a sound? Well, there's three basic categories. Actually, there's four categories, but tonight we're going to focus on the three original categories by Sox and Hornbostel, and that are flutes, reeds, and trumpets. So a flute, we're not, when we talk about the word flute, we use this term to designate an organological category. I know that a lot of us come from from the Western tradition and we're used to the Western flute or a piccolo. Those, that is a flute, but it also is organologically a flute as well. So we don't want to get confused by the names, by the words. The word flute in this case refers to any instrument where the sound has to be split over an edge. So this is like, this is a Chinese pizza. So you, you, you blow across the edge and the air is split over the edge, and that, that vibration then goes through the tube. And as, as you cover up the finger holes, the tube gets longer, and the pitch is lowered. And as you open up the finger holes, the tube gets shorter, and the pitch goes higher. So flutes can be organized in two categories, horizontal flutes and vertical flutes. This, of course, is the traditional recorder that you find in every American public school with classics like uh, hot cross buns and all those great recorder classics. Well, this and all this is is organologically a flute because if you look closely, you'll see that the air is split over an edge. Now there is a mouthpiece and you do blow through the instrument, but there is an opening with the sharp edge that causes the vibration and that gets funneled through the tube as you cover the finger holes the tube gets larger and the pitch goes down. As you uncover the finger holes, the tube gets shorter and the pitch will rise. Now, you can further distinguish the, the types of instruments by which flutes have covers, or you know, if you look at a Western flute, you have actual pads and covers, or you have, in this case, just finger holes. So that's a further designation in terms of how to separate the various flutes. Next are reed instruments. A reed is a vibrating plank, typically a piece of wood. Now, reeds come in all shapes and sizes, and there's three basic categories for reeds. The first is what's referred to as a percussive reed. So you take a piece of wood and you attach it to a tube via a ligature, uh, some device to hold the, the plank onto the wood or onto the tubing, and then that, that beats against the, the tubing, and that vibration gets funneled through the, uh, the tube. The percussive reed, the very, you know, the ones that are most common are the clarinet, which will be discussed in more detail in Wang Mingzhou's discussion, and a saxophone. What I want to show you, though, are some concussive reeds. A concussive reed is something like that. I don't know if you can see this. I can't see myself, so I hope you can see this reed. You can see that there are two reeds. This is what's considered a double reed, and the reeds then concuss, and they hit each other uh, to produce sound. So you can play it by itself, or you can put it into an instrument, and let's see if I can actually do this. So just a uh, you know, to demonstrate sound principles. So again, it's the same basic concept with, um, with the recorder and with the ditsa. As you cover the, this would be covers and not, not finger holes. As you place your fingers on all the covers and you make the tube longer, it makes the pitch go down. And, and conversely, as you raise your fingers up, it makes the, the pitch go higher. So that would be considered a concussive reed. That's the oboe, the bassoon, like you saw in the first video, uh, with the Mozart example, uh, that would be a concussive reed or the, the tie instrument, the B. That's another great example. Now, apart from reed instruments where the reed goes in your mouth, you have what's referred to as free reed instruments, meaning that the reed is somewhere embedded within the tube. So if you were to figure out a way to, to 
get the, the reed inside this tubing and then blow through it and the reed were to vibrate. You're not manipulating the reed with your mouth. Instead, it's, it vibrates freely. So it's considered a free reed. And there are two different categories of free reeds. There's the lung driven free reeds where the air originates in the lung. And then there's a bellows driven free reed where you take a, an air pump like, uh, like an accordion or a harmo an Indian harmonium. And I'll show you a couple of these. So this is a Chinese hulusa, and I think it's actually broken. So I'll, only one of the reeds works. So I don't even know if it'll make sound. So it does. So it, it, this is a free reed. This is what's referred to as a single action free reed, where if it were working correctly, you can inhale and exhale through it and the sound would not change. Um, a Highland bagpipe is the same principle. The Chinese shung, I believe, works on the same principle. The Thai can works on that principle. Another lung-driven aerophone that is um, a free read, but a double action, is the harmonica. And the reason we, we separate this from the other free reads, it's because as you exhale and inhale through the instrument, there's two sets of reeds, uh, they pivot. And so it actually manipulates a double action reed and it creates two different pitches. So, uh, so those are lung driven. A bellows driven aerophone, a bellows driven aerophone would be something like a, an accordion. And this one's actually quite old and in and, and desperate need of repair. So it, it sounds somewhat pathetic in its, uh, its capability to produce the sound. But the way it works is that there's a system of tubing inside the instrument that pushes the air through. So it's, they're called bellows. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the most, probably the most common of all of the bellows driven um, aerophones, free read aerophones. The Indian harmonium is another common one or the Ilian, the union bagpipe of Ireland is another common example. 